Hello everyone, I am so excited. We have the giant social entrepreneur, Paul Polak with us today. He's now the CEO of Spring Health and we are really talking about some exciting climate change, poverty alleviating new stuff. You don't wanna miss this. Welcome to the Your Mark on the World show with your champion of social good, Devin D. Thorpe. Paul, welcome to the show. I'm delighted to be here. Well, we're we're more delighted to have you. Thank you very much. You've got some exciting stuff you're doing with wood chips in Gujarat, India. Tell us about it. Well, uh, Devin, just about everybody in the world, with the exception of our President Trump, uh, is uh, convinced that climate change is one of the main factors that will influence uh, our planet uh, over the next 50 years. At the same time, people who live in extreme poverty, there are still some 800 million of them that live at uh, less than $2 a day. They make a disproportionate influence on things like climate change, on wars, on conflict, and on environmental destruction. Not because they want to, but because they need to to survive. Uh, one of the things that we've been working on in the last few years is a way to address both extreme poverty and climate change together at the village. Uh, and that involves growing a, an invasive uh, a species of hardwood, uh, run, drying it, harvesting it and drying it, running it through a chipper, and then subjecting it to a process uh, called torrefaction, which is simply heating it uh, to a somewhere between 180 and 240 degrees centigrade indirectly. It's a, it's a process that's just exactly the same as roasting coffee. What you get as an end result is a viable substitute for coal. Interesting. But that substitute uh, contributes uh, very little to climate change, and I can explain why. Yeah, so the, the primary reason, of yeah. course, is that it's a renewable energy, that the the, uh, you, you grow trees again and they suck in the carbon that you emit when you burn the tree. It's a, it's a, it's a cycle, a renewable cycle in the truest sense, rather than taking coal, which is sequestered carbon and releasing it into the atmosphere. Um, but uh, does it burn more cleanly than coal as well? Um, it tends to have less uh, pollution substances in it. Coal sometimes has uh, arsenic, sometimes has sulfur, which uh, themselves contribute to pollution. Um, and and uh, there are a couple of other very critical main differences. Um, all biomass, including you and me, take uh, carbon out of the atmosphere in order to grow. And when we die and uh, uh, our bodies rot and the plants, uh, trees rot, it releases it again. The thing about coal is that it represents biomass that pulled carbon out of the atmosphere 200 million years ago. Right. We dig it up and burn it, we return it to the atmosphere. Uh, we, we can burn the coal efficiently, more efficiently or less efficiently, <clears throat> same as a, a burning horrified mesquite. Uh, but the essential issue is that something that has been uh, sequestered out of the atmosphere for 200 million years is released. And in this case, it's been sequestered for three years because invasive species like mesquite, if you plant a mesquite seedling, it'll grow into a harvestable tree in three years. It'll grow a taproot of 165 feet in three years. And that's what makes it invasive because it sucks up all the water that's available, especially in semi-arid areas that are too dry to grow conventional crops. Yeah. Now that, so that's the basic. Uh, yeah, it's a fascinating thing. Are there plants uh, that are using coal today that could switch to the torrified mesquite chips immediately yes. if you could produce the answer them? is yes. <clears throat> and the single biggest application, and uh, then that's the end of the, my summary uh, of, of burning coal, is to create electricity. So for instance, in India, uh, some 60% of all the electricity produced in India comes from burning coal. Coal is burned to, 
to boil water, to produce steam, to turn a rotor that, that makes electricity. Uh, some 30 or 40 percent of electricity in this country is still coal. And while the world is trying to expand the solar and wind, which has a, their own limitations, uh, there's still for a long time in the future, uh, at least 50 years, we'll still be using coal to a large extent because it's cheap, widely dispersed and easily available. So what we need is a substitute for coal. And the <clears throat> key kicker is this. You can plant eventually uh, what I see is 100,000, 200 hectare plantations of mesquite in poor uh, regions in developing countries like India. And uh, when you do that, when you harvest it, uh, the first harvest is within three years. You leave the roots in the ground and that's uh, some 50% of the plant. So whatever carbon, excess carbon you put into the atmosphere from uh, uh, inefficiencies in the burning is more than uh, balanced by the roots that remain in the ground. So you've got pretty close to a, a neutral carbon impact source of electricity. That can have a massive global impact on climate change and since you can grow these plantations in poor rural areas with climates that are too dry to grow crops, you can have a huge impact on poverty as well in growing, harvesting, uh, drying, chipping. And then the plants where you can now produce electricity, it requires uh, creating, uh, designing a whole new generation of smaller dispersed electricity generating plants and those are not going to be as efficient as the large centralized plants are now, but they will eliminate much of the loss in uh, carrying that electricity over power lines because you're going to have a very short delivery, uh, a few kilometer delivery uh, radius for delivering the electricity. So I see this as a, as a future way of creating uh, dispersed, radically dispersed electricity and delivering it with short supply uh, chains uh, to customers. It seems like it uh, makes a good uh, uh, kind of microgrid complement to wind and solar that uh, don't provide that baseload power that uh, coal so famously provides. That's exactly it. And like so many things that are that can be truly transformative, it's not uh, rocket science. In fact, uh, we have uh, volunteer rocket scientists from from Ball Aerospace who are the designers of this as volunteers. I'm very grateful to them. Uh, but it's pretty obvious. It's not uh, it's not E equals M C squared. It's creating. Uh, a source of energy that is dispersed, delivering electricity that is dispersed, and replacing uh, coal, which a lot of uh, the initiatives in the world are, are focusing on, replacing coal uh, and burning it more efficiently when it has to be. Now, how does the proposal you make affect the people in the community? Well, the people in the community who are growing and uh, harvesting and chipping and then ultimately using this uh, uh, dispersed mass, uh, it affects them profoundly. I think it'll uh, very quickly create a million new jobs in the poor areas that are dry areas. Um, it uh, provides a source of affordable energy and energy is a critical uh, Part of the path to uh, move, uh, moving out of poverty. And best of all, uh, it can be done uh, in the form of a for profit global business that doesn't rely on uh, making uh, charitable contributions to poor people. Charitable contributions, I've uh, come to believe over the last 40 years, while they're useful, they don't end poverty. The real engine that ends poverty is an engine where poor people uh, help themselves move out of poverty with uh, some uh, ideas and resources like, uh, for instance, this approach to creating electricity. Excellent. Um, 
Now you've spent some time in Gujarat. You've you've looked at some of these uh, mesquite forests already uh, and visited power plants. Uh, how quickly can this be implemented in a place like Gujarat? I think that we can bring it up to uh, full production uh, uh, and make it uh, make an impact on poverty and energy globally within ten years. Uh, we should be able. Uh, we have developed a very simple uh, technology with the help of these uh, uh, ball uh, aerospace engineers, these rocket scientists. We've created a, a simple kiln using a rotating 55 gallon drum. Uh, we, we put the mesquite chips uh, into that drum, fill it about 70%, it rotates. The off gases from, a pro from the process of pyrolysis, uh, when these chips are heated uh, above 200 degrees, they produce gas, that can be used as a source of energy for the process. And so uh, I think that we can uh, 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 finalize the bigger kiln with with uh, 12 of these barrels in two years uh in another two years uh, make sure it works in three actual sites in gujarat and have it up and running and rapidly scalable in gujarat in other states in india and globally uh within five years it will take about uh, five hundred thousand dollars to reach the point where it can take off and another probably three to five million dollars uh, to uh, reach um, uh, scalable profitability on, on a significant scale. And from then on, it'll take take off on its own. I've actually gone through this cycle before with simpler uh, technology uh, uh, with IBE, where we uh, sold two or three million treadle pumps and and then helped 30 million people uh, who lived on two dollars a day double their income and this is simply the next step up uh, in a massive uh, global enterprise uh, strategy uh, fascinating fascinating work paul the as you um look at this process uh what are the milestones you've already achieved number one uh, there's plenty of literature on the availability of mesquite around the world. Uh, you mentioned Gujarat. It represents about 50% of the existing forest cover uh, of Gujarat. Uh, that said, if you start to use it at a, in a very large scale, the price will go up. It's used very, it's very popular as a source of firewood. It also produces fodder for, for crops and it has a nitrogen fixing, uh, component, uh, uh, one of the things is that mesquite is simply one of the uh, types of biomass that can be used. So the first uh, milestone is uh, creating uh, uh, three of these plants. Uh, well, okay, uh, I'll take that back. First milestone is creating a 12-barrel kin. We've, we've got a one-barrel kin. Second milestone is uh, beta testing that at three sites, actual sites in, in a state like Gujarat in India. Third milestone is proving its commercial viability as the, uh, in the form of a multinational corporation. Next uh, milestone is uh, uh, attracting the investment capital to make that uh, corporation work. And the final milestone is uh, spreading it around the world. We've done this. Uh, uh, we've uh, started with uh, treadle pumps, which is a simple manual irrigation pump with IDE. Over the course of 10, mi uh, uh, 10 years, uh, IDE distributed some two to three million of those and helped 30 million people move out of poverty. Uh, this follows the identical process, but has a much broader global application and impact. Yeah. When, uh, when we reduce carbon outputs, it really benefits all of us uh, in a way that's different than, um, and more direct than when we uh, help people out of poverty. Both are noble, both are noble, but we have a, a little larger self-interest in, uh, in the carbon reduction. Uh, Paul, you've had a, an extraordinary career. You mentioned the treadle pumps. What are you most proud of having accomplished? What I haven't accomplished yet with uh, with uh, climate change and poverty. 
uh, and in the past, of course, uh, you know, I'm no, I'm not a spring chicken. I'm 85 years old. I don't know how much longer I've got. If uh, not, if I accomplish nothing else than helping 30 million two dollar a day people uh, double their income, I'm happy with that. And a lot of these things are unpredictable how they how they evolve. So, uh, but I'm very excited by uh, by this opportunity. And there's a couple of oper other opportunities that I'm pursuing. And it, it, sometimes uh, you might think that I'm, I'm nuts because I start on a very meager scale with very little funding. And then if, if, if you're doing something that is really uh, connected to something much deeper and global, things have a way of uh, happening on their own course that you can't predict. And I just love that process. And we seem to be right at the critical point of that process with uh, replacing uh, coal. Uh, so I'm very excited by what happens and uh, other people join me. I've handed over IDE of course, and it's run totally separately and uh, it it's, uh, it's continues to be successful. What I hope is this, uh, that the same uh, steps will happen with replacing coal. Yeah. What's the most important lesson you've learned through your career? You've, you've shared some great insights in some of your writing, but what, if you were to just highlight one key lesson, what, what is it? Stay curious, uh, keep on learning. I mean, uh, the most important thing that, uh, that has influenced what I've done in the world is uh, I, I realized that we lay a lot of our own ideas on poor people. Instead of that, I interviewed some 3,000 of them uh, in some depth and uh, related to them as my teachers and my friends. That's the most profound thing because it changed everything. So what I've learned from poor people themselves, so this, this whole approach to replacing coal doesn't come from reading books, although there is already a very thorough literature on for affection, for example, you'd make use of that. But if you then go and talk to people in the state of Gujarat, who are currently users of electricity, who are uh, growing and selling mesquite firewood, uh, that's the only way, uh, the, the only things that I've accomplished have come directly from uh, doing this with patients. And, uh, you know, my process, I'll interview, my process for learning from poor people is I'll interview one typical poor family for eight hours. And I'll ask them what they had for breakfast, uh, what they feed their dog, how far the kids go to school. I become friends. I work with them through their fields. I have tea. I have to take a pee somehow and find a way of doing that and continue to have tea. Then I'll interview another six or seven uh, at one or two hours. I've never done that process. That takes five days never gone through that process without uh, stumbling upon at least one transformative idea. The key part of all of this is learning from customers themselves, which is again, not anything new. All successful businesses have a process for uh, systematically continuing to learn from customers. And that's all I do. No, that's great. Paul, why do you do this? You've been at this, as you mentioned, for 40 years. Brilliant guy that you are. You could have done anything. Why this? It's what makes me happier than anything else. I know. I, look, I, uh, I was a real estate entrepreneur. I had 300 department units. I bought the mismanaged units, fixed the management, made money. But if I kept doing that, what, what would have been the end result? If I, if I have a hundred million dollars or a billion dollars and then I croak, then what? But somehow in this process, I have ended up with such a deep connection to something bigger than, than myself. I'm not a formally religious person, although my wife is a Mennonite minister, but I have such a feeling of contentment and peace uh, and, and that sense of being in deep connection to something bigger than myself and following where the spirit guides me 
that's that gives me more happiness than anything else I could have done. I have no regrets. Although sometimes I wish I could uh, uh, could have more money and so on. But I made enough money to survive. It took me about 10 years in real estate. Mm-hmm. So been in the oil business. I love being an entrepreneur, but doing something that gives me a deep peace and connection to something bigger than myself makes me happier than anything else I could have done. That's great. Paul, what is your superpower? Superpower? I don't know what the, what do you mean by superpower? (laughs) What makes you great? Capacity to transform uh, the biggest challenges the planet faces into a constructive end result. Uh, And, uh, and helps each of the things I'm doing now is designed to help a hundred million people help themselves and, uh, and reach a level of prosperity. Uh, that's if you call it a superpower. That's it. Fantastic. Well, Paul, thank you so much for sharing your ideas with us. Uh, I, I'm excited to see what you're doing with spring health and we wish you every success with that. Before you go, would you take just a minute and tell people how they can learn more about this work and how they can connect with you personally. Uh, check with paulpolak.com uh, on the internet. Uh, my email is paul.r.polak at gmail.com. And uh, you mentioned Spring Health. That's another initiative that is uh, making a big impact already. We're selling safe drinking water to, in, to good people in villages that are getting sick. Uh, from drinking water that is polluted with fecal pathogens. And we're just at the point with that company of uh, uh, approaching break even. And that will take off as well and provide a last mile distribution system. So, uh, paulpolak.com, you've got my email. Great. Paul, thank you so much for being with us. And we wish you every success in your continued effort to help hundreds of millions of people work themselves out of poverty. And thank you for your work. It's no small thing to have an interview like this four days a week. I I know what that takes. So congratulations. Thank you very much. Now let's do some good. Thank you for listening. Devon Thorpe's mission is to end extreme poverty, improve global health, and mitigate climate change before 2045 by finding and sharing the stories of those who are doing the most good. You can join with other listeners to accelerate Devon's mission by visiting helpdevon.org right now.